Greetings, Meet the Ocean fans. I'm your host, Paul North, and you are soon to hear a scientist tell a tale of Greenlandic salmon. But before we dig in, I want to remind you that Meet the Ocean has over 65 podcasts for you to listen to and learn from. Our library of educational content is being used by teachers, families, and curious minds around the world. This is what science communication sounds like. But to continue, we need your help. You can support our nonprofit and the continued creation of conservation content on our website, meettheocean.org. And now, on to our episode. Meet, 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 meet the ocean. I'm Hunter Snyder. I'm a fishery scientist and I'm a National Geographic explorer. And I work in the fishery sector in Greenland. I've been working in Greenland since 2013. And most recently, my work in Greenland has been focused on understanding how well people follow rules in the fishery sector. Do you like seafood? Mm. It's a question that I ask people quite often because I personally love seafood. Usually they say, yeah, I like fish. And I often ask them, well, what kinds of fish do you like? Do you like white fish? Do you like dense meat fish? Do you also eat shellfish? And they often say, well, I really like salmon. And I say, oh, that's cool. Do you like wild salmon or farm salmon? And they often say, I really don't have a preference for either. That's not an unusual response, I think, because about 4% of every single fish that are farmed are Atlantic salmon. That's kind of amazing because a lot of people think of Atlantic salmon as the most ubiquitous salmonid in the entire world. And that might be true, but Atlantic salmon also still exist in the wild. And that's something that is changing every single year. Atlantic salmon are farmed all throughout the world in Chile and Norway, in the Canadian Maritimes in the United States. But wild salmon are distributed throughout the Barents Sea, in the Norwegian Sea, in the North Sea, and throughout the Atlantic Ocean around the Gulf of Maine and the Canadian Maritimes, and also up into the Northwest Atlantic around Greenland. And the picture for Atlantic salmon is patchy. On the whole, Atlantic salmon stocks are in decline. The reasons for this vary quite a lot and are largely unknown. Salmonids are an interesting fin fish because they spend the early parts of their life in freshwater rivers. When they grow to a certain stage, they swim out into the wide ocean. And at that point, they gain most of their biomass feeding in these rich, bountiful waters in the marine system. After a certain point in time, they return to their rivers of origin where they spawn and they add reproductive value to their stock. In the case of the Atlantic salmon, a lot of these fish are leaving the rivers of origin in the Canadian Maritimes, in the Gulf of Maine, in the North Sea, the Norwegian Sea, and the Barents. And they're swimming in and up to the waters around Greenland, the Arctic territory that's part of the Kingdom of Denmark. And in this land, these fish are being caught by recreational and professional fishers, most of whom are Kalashit Inuit. In the last 40 years, there has been pressure put on Greenland to reduce its catches of salmon. And the idea behind that is that if salmon are not caught in the waters around Greenland, they can swim back to their rivers of origin and add value to this, those stocks. The basic idea is, well, if you can't reproduce, how can the stock grow? If you live in Greenland and you want to fish for Atlantic salmon, you're either classified as a professional or a private fisher. Both of those categories require that you have a license to do so. The problem is that the reporting of catches of Atlantic salmon has been poor. And there are three prevailing ideas that plague negotiations for the right to fish for Atlantic salmon in Greenland. Those three ideas have to do with underreporting, not reporting, and over-reporting of Atlantic salmon catches. And we can imagine why those three scenarios could play out. If 
you have pressure from an international consortium of NGOs, as well as scientific advice that shows that Atlantic salmon are declining, it might make sense to put a quota in place, which says that in a given year, you can only catch 30 tons or 20 tons or 10 tons. If you're a recreational fisher of Atlantic salmon in Greenland, and you know that there is only so many fish that can be caught each year, when it comes time to reporting your catches, instead of reporting 10, maybe you report nine or eight or five or zero. And maybe throughout the season, your behavior to report changes. Maybe at the beginning of the season, there are 30 tons available, so you're happy to report exactly what you caught. But when the season comes to a close, you decide to maybe report only 50% of your catches. You can also imagine that over-reporting could occur in this fishery. If the quota is set every year through a dialogue with international stakeholders from Canada and the United States and Europe, and every year these organizations are trying to encourage you as a Greenlander to catch fewer salmon, you might find yourself in a position where you need to lobby for your right to catch them. If the quota in one year is 30 tons and in the next year they want it to be 20, well, you need to have evidence that you need those 30. I often describe it as something that plays out in a, in a professional workplace. If you have in your department a budget of $10,000 and the fiscal year is about to close and you've only used six of those thousand dollars, you might try to spend the rest of your budget so as to ensure that you have that budget for the next year. The same idea could take place in the salmon fishery in Greenland. You might catch 10 fish, but you know that next year's quota might be slashed, so you instead report 15 or 20. There's also the reality that reporting catches is a cumbersome process. If you, as an Atlantic salmon fisher in Greenland, have to send a piece of paper by fax or mail, you might say, well, why do I need to send this paper in? So I don't need to report my catches. Maybe I didn't catch anything. If any of these outcomes are the case, then it's understandable why Atlantic salmon conservation organizations have an unclear picture of what the catches of salmon are. And it's also very unclear the degree to which those catches have an impact on the overall declines of Atlantic salmon stocks. So maybe you're asking yourself, why should we care about Atlantic salmon? Well, it comes back to the reality that there are farmed and wild Atlantic salmon. And to understand that, we have to appreciate that most Atlantic salmon that we interact with or enjoy are coming from farmed operations and are not of the wild variant. But the wild variant are still existing and are in decline in many parts of the region. And we need to understand what is driving those declines in order for them to exist into the future. And the work that we're doing is focused on really understanding the reporting behavior of Greenlandic fishermen. And you might say to yourself, well, that seems like kind of a technical activity and maybe isn't really all that interesting. But if we're able to understand how willing people are to report their catches truthfully, we can rule out the role that Greenland has played in the declines of Atlantic salmon throughout the region. If we have an understanding that the catches that are reported by Greenland are truthful and accurate, then we can start to devote our energies toward other areas that might be driving the declines of Atlantic salmon. Those could be things like predation at sea, hatchery practices, the presence of dams, coastal development, and rising temperatures in our oceans. And at this point, when it comes to Atlantic salmon being caught in Greenland, we don't have a full enough picture to rule that out. As a fishery scientist, I'm drawn to developing tools that can understand more fully the human dimensions of fisheries. We often think about our oceans as ecological spaces, but they're also inhabited by people. And in Greenland, fishing is a major part of an Inuit lifeway. Salmon are one of the many fishes that are vital in the seasonal uptake of fish proteins. And the reason that I'm drawn to do this work is because Greenlanders have a deep appreciation and there is a cultural significance for Atlantic salmon. 
I think it's really important that when we make decisions about whether salmon should be fished in Greenland, we understand fully what people's preferences are for catching them and how truthful they are in reporting their catches. And above all, I think it's really important for us to devote our resources to potential drivers of the declines of Atlantic salmon rather than chasing the red herrings that might be there. And that's exactly what the work that we're doing sets out to do. Meet the Ocean is produced by Paul North and Andrew Gettings, with sound design by Kelsey Anderson. Special thanks to National Geographic Explorer and fishery scientist Hunter Snyder for sharing the story of Atlantic salmon. We are a listener-supported nonprofit. You can find more podcasts, underwater creatures, and ways to donate to our educational outreach on our website, meettheocean.org. Subscribe to our podcast to never miss an episode. Support us on Patreon. And please rate and review Meet the Ocean on Apple Podcasts or on whatever platform you choose to listen. Until next time, may the salt water be with you. And just if you were wondering... The Greenlandic word for Atlantic salmon is kapisichlit. <laughs>